I'd like to give a really warm welcome to the Secretary of State, thank him for the huge commitment he's shown in the last month to understanding the issues, getting out there, talking to lots and lots of people in our sector and, and beyond. It's been kind of a really prodigious effort to, to listen and, and, and understand. And it really is very exciting to have an Environment Secretary who's passionate about the cause, uh, but also committed to making a real difference. And I, I look forward to working with you uh, in the months and years and decades to come, uh, and also to hearing what you have to say now. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Sean for uh, the opportunity to speak on this platform this evening, but I'd also like to um, register my respect for the phenomenal level of research of which he's capable. Um, I had thought that the only person who knew that I had read Geoffrey Parker's book was my wife, <laughs> who uh, found a holiday that we spent in France um, was less entertaining for her than she might have expected because I would look up from it and then recite statistics about what had happened to crop yields during the Ming Dynasty or why it was that the Thirty Years' War had indeed lasted so long. And uh, she grew weary of my fascination with that book. But I'm glad that it has uh, uh, encouraged Sean. And I also sympathise with Sean's own partner, uh, who presumably will also <laughs> have suffered from the same recitation of facts as they devoured that text. But in that text, Sean is absolutely right, stands a warning. Because the climate change that occurred in the 17th century wrought devastation to the globe. And the Thirty Years' War, the English Civil War, the collapse of the Ming Dynasty, the collapse of the Spanish Empire, all of these things were accelerated or driven forward by dramatic changes in climate, in crop yields, in the economy, and that book, exactly as Sean says, is history as warning. And it underlines another of my beliefs. Almost everyone in this room, I suspect, will have a background in science or in economics. And these are two vital tools in making sure that we get environmental stewardship and environmental enhancement right. And I can't claim to have a background in either. I love history, and I read English at university. But as a result of having read English at university, as a result of having grown up where I did, my commitment to the environment springs from the heart and from emotions. One of my favorite books, one of my uh, uh, most cherished novels, is Lewis Grassic Gibbon's Sunset Song. And for those of you who've read it, you will know that it is an immensely moving story about life in the in Cardinshire of the uh, pre-war era. And it is a hymn to natural beauty and a lament as to what happens when that natural beauty is eroded by forces, whether commercial or political, beyond the control of citizens. I'm also a huge fan of Thomas Hardy and William Wordsworth. And having grown up studying English literature, loving the environment in Scotland where I grew up, it seems to me that now, in this role, I have an opportunity to write a new chapter. And that new chapter should be a chapter in the history of this country, where we take advantage of the opportunities that are now in front of us to strengthen the protection and to enhance the quality of our environment. As Sean mentioned, we're leaving the European Union. And the uh, Great Repeal Bill, which was published today, as Sean mentioned, will be scrutinized. And I'm in listening mode, and I wanted to hear all the concerns and hopes that people have for that legislation. But as well as that individual piece of legislation published today, there is also an opportunity for us to reshape not just environmental regulation, but also the role that my department plays. As we leave the European Union, no matter how hard or soft Brexit will be, the common agricultural policy will be replaced. The common fisheries policy will exist without us. And that means that we have a unique challenge. How can we ensure that what replaces the common fisheries policy, which at the moment leads to overfishing at a rate which is more than 50% higher than scientific advice would recommend, how can we ensure that our new fisheries management, which marine conservation, and the survival and the strengthening of that wonderful natural renewable resource at the heart of what we do, and also, how can we ensure that a common agricultural policy takes on 
some of the valuable work of the past in putting greening and countryside stewardship at the heart of policy, but goes further. One of my major concerns with the common agricultural policy is that it's been designed in such a way that it doesn't put the environment first, and it's reinforced an unhappy tension in the minds of some between the interests of farmers and the interests of those who care about our environment. To me, those interests should be, as they are in the minds and hearts of the best farmers, aligned. And that's why I think that any replacement for the existing common agricultural policy should ensure that farmers are rewarded for providing environmental goods, whether that's uh, protecting or enhancing the habitats that provide biodiversity, whether that's ensuring that we plant more trees in a way which will ensure that we combat soil erosion, provide a carbon sink, and also provide an environment for those bird and other species that we want to nurture and see return. And also, I think that any future common agricultural policy has to go with the grain of those who currently own and manage land and want to ensure that they can pass it on in an enhanced form to the next generation. Now, in reshaping that policy, I need help. Help from people in this room. I need to ensure that the decisions we take about subsidy and about regulation, about penalties and incentives, about new market mechanisms and new government edicts is shaped with one aim at its heart, the enhancement of our environment. Of course we've got to ensure that the rural economy remains strong. Of course we've got to ensure that farmers are insulated from the vicissitudes of the weather, pests, and other assaults on their income. But we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get this right. We have an opportunity to ensure that in this country we can develop, as Sean indicates we need, the institutions and mechanisms that the world will look to and admire as the most effective in protecting our environment and enhancing our countryside. And more than that, we have an opportunity to be global leaders in the fight against climate change, global leaders when it comes to animal welfare and the fight against the illegal wildlife trade, global leaders in ensuring that we recognize that as we write that next chapter in our national history, we have a chance to make that chapter one of global significance as the cause of the environment, the cause of our planet, the cause of the natural world is one that people can look back on and say that our generation lived up to that challenge and handed on to the next generation a planet that was greener, cleaner, better, richer. And for that noble cause, I want to thank you for everything that you have done, the leadership that you've shown, and the conversations that we're about to have, during which I promise to spend more of my time listening than I spend talking. Thank you all very much. Thank you.